Good morning. I am Dr. Sandra, and first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Linda for her kind invitation for me to be a part of the symposium today. So I'll be talking on telemedicine and its application for the rehabilitation of children with visual impairment from cerebral visual impairment. I do not have any financial interests or relationships to disclose, but I do have the permission from the parents for showing the videos of their children for educational purpose. Let me tell you the story of eight month old Muhammad, who was born preterm at 32 weeks with a birth weight of 2.4 kilos. His parents complained of poor visual milestones and global developmental delay. And on MRI, there was periventricular leukomalacia. You can see the mom showing the lighted target to elicit a visual response in this video. The second is nine month old Vidatri, who was born, a full, born of a full term normal delivery with a 2.8 kilo birth weight, but she had seizures from one month of age. She had poor vision and global developmental delay. Her MRI was normal, but on further genetic testing, she was CDKL5 positive. You can see her mom again showing a lighted target to elicit a visual response and her grandmother showing the bright red and yellow target for her to fix and follow. The third kid is nine month old Suvikshana, born term of lower segment caesarean with a birth weight of 3.1 kilos, but she became hypoglycemic on the day six of life with seizures. Since then, she has not been seeing faces and there is a history of light gazing. And on MRI, there is cystic encephalomalacia with overlying cortical atrophy in the parido occipital region and significant white matter atrophy. You can see in this video, the mom showing a lighted toy again to elicit a visual response. What's common with all these kids? All these children were diagnosed with cerebral vision impairment uh, and all these children belong to phase one where the brain does not interpret and the brain does not know that the eyes can see. CVI is an impairment of vision caused by dysfunction, anomaly, or injury to the retrogenipulate vision pathways, not explained by ocular pathology. The common causes include perinatal hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, hypoglycemia, CNS infections, hydrocephalus, epilepsy, trauma, and congenital malformations. In developing countries like India currently, an increasing number of preterm and children with perinatal brain injuries are surviving, and that has led to an increased prevalence of children with CVI. An improved diagnosis and increased reporting of this condition may also have led to the reported increase. For these kids, early recognition, early initiation of therapy, and a continuum of care are very essential for optimal rehabilitation. And treating kids with CVI has always been a team approach involving pediatricians, ophthalmologists, neurologists, occupational therapists, teachers, and early childhood specialists who all work hand in hand. So let's come to the current problem, the year being 2020. These kids were seen by us just at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in India. There was a national lockdown in place and hospitals were open to emergency services only. The impact of COVID-19 led to a global crisis in access to safe and continuous healthcare and rehab services. Parents, doctors, and therapists were experiencing a lot of difficulty in connecting with each other, and the most vulnerable were at a disadvantage because they lost the time when the interventions could give a positive response. So how do we help them to see? Could telemedicine offer an interim solution Lately, there has been a lot of provided interest with telemedicine as it could promise timely services and easier follow-ups, especially with the pandemic on. So with regard to India, we decided that a hybrid care model uh, could serve us better where we can merge teleophthalmology into the existing healthcare systems with in-person visits alternating with teleconsultations to monitor the child's progress on a regular basis and also to ensure that the family gets continued support. So this is our model that we have been practicing for the past year. So we've initially list the children whom we see in our CVI clinic and also develop an individualized plan for each child, which includes building visual behavior, integrating with play and daily care activities. We ask the parents for consent and feasibility of online consults for follow-ups. And if they are willing, they have to send us a structured filled in questionnaire and the functional videos of the child prior to the program. 
So in between the period of May 2020 to June 2021, we had seen 30 kids diagnosed with CVI in our clinic and the caregivers who did not have an internet connectivity were excluded from the program. So the initial exam was in clinic and it was quite detailed, including age appropriate vision assessment, accommodative response, orthoptic assessment, anti-resegment evaluation, cycloretinoscopy and fundus evaluation, and also functional vision assessment using LIA paddles, LIA mailbox to assess the direction orientation, LIA puzzles, hiding ID, low contrast face test, color and visual field preference. And all kids underwent an MRI to assess the extent of the neurological insult. Interventions were suggested based on the phase they were in. Phase one, where the child, the brain cannot interpret that they can see. We instructed the caregivers to show single illuminated toys in red and yellow colors in a dark room, supplementation with tactile sense, use of sensory tent, increasing contrast, and pairing words with touch and language. And for kids belonging to phase two and three, we suggest mirror play, sibling play, mobility training, integrating the interventions with play, self-care and daily activities. And in children who are non-verbal and with poor motor abilities, we advise the parents to use the ice case choice making as a means of communication. All of them were prescribed glasses to aid in focus and magnification. And two months following the in-person initial evaluation, we emailed a questionnaire which was sent by WhatsApp to the parents consisting of 24 questions to assess the functional vision and CVI characteristics and seven questions to judge the caregiver's understanding of the child's condition, satisfaction with the program and recommendations for further improvement. So the answered questionnaire and the videos demonstrating the child's function were reviewed by us prior to the Zoom meeting which was arranged on an appointment basis. And we also tried to include the child's pediatrician, occupational therapist, and others based on availability. In all these videos, you can see the kids uh, are able to fix and follow the brightly colored toys. And they are also complained with wearing glasses. Here, the mom is engaging in a, a play activity and the child enjoys outdoor activities. Child is able to eat food by herself and can pick up a toy among a, in a cluttered environment and also enjoying sibling play. All these have been possible with the uh, continuous uh, follow-ups that we have been uh, having with these families. And again, a child enjoying sibling play and uh, uh, putting their eyes into a bowl so they enjoy the touch sensation and also integrating vision. So over the course of the last year, we have seen around 30 children, a slightly more number of boys than girls, age ranging between seven months to seven years with a mean of 2.7. Majority of them uh, having suffered from hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, few of them being preterm, few having seizure disorder, neonatal hypoglycemia in four kids, sepsis and meningitis in three, and one had chronic risk, two had isolated genetic anomalies. Most of them who are in phase one and phase two of the Hoyle's visual grading had improved to phase two, three, and four, and five by the end of our program. And also many of them's vision had improved by one level and few of them, the vision had improved by two levels also. So what happened to Muhammad at the end of a year? He can eat his own food, he can play with his siblings, he can reach for toys, he also enjoys playing with the mirror. And from the questionnaire, we show a lot of improvement in the child being able to establish eye contact now, can recognize familiar faces, can follow the object shown consistently, and he can recognize day-to-day -day objects and a whole lot of other spheres. And uh, Vidatri again has shown a lot of promise and improvement. And you can see her playing with her toys and she's able to recognize her mom and enjoys playing. Motar milestones also, she can sit with support now. And her parents have joined the support group, which has helped them to reach out to other parents with a similar condition. And uh, Suvikshana again, has uh, shown a lot of improvement and she can play with her toys and she can, her motor milestones has also improved and the questionnaire wise also she has shown improvement in very many spheres. So the additional benefits discovered with telehealth, it has been convenient and cost effective. The child are examined in home environment. There is an ability to connect with multiple specialists together. There has been a reduce in the in-person visits and that has promoted complaints and surely it has reduced economic 
burden. And uh, in fact, it has even been a platform for training, even for us, because we have been continuously getting inputs with Dr. Linda. And also we have included trainees from India and from around the world, including Haiti and USA who attend our programs. And the attendees include ophthalmologists, optometrists, speech language pathologists and medical students. Sometimes the limitations could be the unfamiliarity of the usage of the platform for the doctor and the patient, concerns on accuracy, privacy and safety, lack of the policy guidelines, valuation of services and miscommunication and misunderstanding can uh, lead to confusions. So teleophthalmology can supplement but cannot entirely replace the in-person visits. Particularly, it helps to increase the frequency and availability of services. The in-person visit may be mandatory for initial assessment and prescribing glasses, but in future, we look towards increasing the scope of teleservices to include the clinical assessments, including color, contrast, and field. So it has minimized the barriers to access healthcare, rehab, and support services. There has been a reduction in exposure to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it supports families who are in quarantine and lockdown and unable to travel, but it may find usefulness even beyond the pandemic in connecting specialists and families together, but there is definitely a need to develop standardized solutions. Thank you very much.